uh, we have this class and one more before we actually have to put into practice what we've been learning since the beginning uh, of the year. And uh, my plan is that we will continue sometime after Pesach. We're not done yet. There's more to go. But I'm hoping, like I said last week, we'll get at least to the meal. That seems to be what everyone wants to do at, at my seders anyway. Just get to the meal. So we'll get to the meal by the time we arrive at Pesach. And then we'll spend a few weeks after um, Pesach itself to talk about what happens after the meal at the Seder. It, it shouldn't be because the back of the Seder, it's in, there's a lot of interesting stuff, but um, uh, enough that we can cover in just a few weeks time. So we have been, just to remind everybody where we are, we're finishing up the Midrashim that are told on the four principal verses of the Haggadah. The Haggadah tells the story of the Exodus of Egypt from four verses that are found in Deuteronomy that are uh, associated with the Bikurim ceremony, the ceremony of first fruits that happened uh, when the temple stood. The farmer would go to the temple and announce uh, that these fruits, which were the first fruits of his harvest, are being dedicated and are also being given in gratitude. And there are verses that he has to, that he has to say and these are the verses that are found in the Haggadah, beginning with Arami Obedavi, my father, my father was a wandering Aramean. And these verses tell the story of the exodus from Egypt. And, and the Midrashim, again, try to dig and expound into the meaning, deeper meaning behind each word, behind each verse, to try and understand um, uh, what the story is that's actually being told. Because in four verses, we, we have a lot of dense information. What we saw last week is an interesting theme in the Haggadah, right? As we're confronting one of its central questions or one of the central questions that, that the reader might pose upon uh, um, going on this journey, journey of, ex, of uh, slavery to freedom. And that is not what happened, but why. Why is it that God... Um, had us endure slavery for so long anyway. Um, why would a good beneficent God want people to suffer? So we started talking last week about the theology of the Haggadah, that that question, while it might be significant for us, is not as significant for the authors of the Haggadah. The, the Haggadah understands slavery in Egypt to have been part of God's plan from the very beginning. And God is upright, up front, excuse me, with um, Abraham when he makes a covenant with Abraham, saying, Your descendants are going to go down to Egypt and they're so and they they're they will sojourn there, and then you'll return. So the Haggadah doesn't ask the question why the the this is part, all of it is part of God's plan. And God's plan for the Jewish people was never just you're going to take an El Al flight to Israel first class and enjoy your, enjoy your lives there. It was always about enduring slavery in order that you might become a people there that understands and experiences what it is like to be oppressed and what it is like to be a foreigner. Because your mission in the world when you eventually will get to freedom is to remind the world that oppression ought not be taken for granted, that we can rise, humanity can rise <clears throat> above it, that we can have a better <laughs> world where none are oppressed, where might does not make right. But, but in the theology of the Haggadah, in order to get there, we first had to experience slavery. And so, what we looked at last week was that the Haggadah really has no problem with slavery itself. It was part of the plan. The question really is how long did it have to endure and what causes God finally to say, now we've got to get you out of here. So what did we see? We see that it was, we had descended, the Jewish people had descended 
to a point where their uh, very survival was in crisis. We saw that babies were being thrown into rivers, that uh, couples had stopped wanting to have children, and that's what God sees. Then we talked about violence and why is it that God had to get the, uh, our ancestors out of Egypt through violent means. This is when the Haggadah makes reference to God's Yad Chazaka and Zeroa Netuya, his outstretched arm, being symbolic of a military conquest. And um, how important it is, I think, that the Haggadah makes room for the reality that just because you're a people that's on the side of the oppressed, you have to understand that sometimes bad people in the world can only be overcome with violent means. You want to confront people? You can't always do it with <laughs> teaching. You can't always do it with kindness. You can't always do it with peace negotiations and treaties. Sometimes violence just has to be confronted with power. And that is part of the story. However, the Haggadah makes it clear that it was God who waged war on behalf of the people and that it was waged in such a way that a, a militarism, a religion that might have been born from conquest and violence that we didn't go that far. Why? Because God waged this war on our behalf. We did not. Right? This is uh, implied in the way God is highlighted in the Haggadah as being the one. It was no angel, no messenger. Right? The Haggadah says it over and over again. Don't think even Moses did this. We're not a militaristic people. God waged war on our behalf. Now, this is the way the Haggadah tells the story, which is really fascinating. Now, we're, we're at the, the uh, page that begins, Uve Otot. So it's hard for me. I can't tell you where this is because you all have different Haggadot. But... Um, this is in the last of the four verses, a couple of pages before, right near where you have the 10 plagues. So if you could find where the 10 plagues are in your Haggadah and look back a couple of pages, you'll probably find Uve Otot, Uve Moftim, right? The signs and the wonders, these are the last two words of the four verses that we expound upon in the Haggadah. So what does the Haggadah say otot means and moftim? Otot is zeha mate. The otot, the sign, is Moses' staff. Now, isn't it interesting? We talked last week about why is it, or I think a couple of weeks ago, about why Moses is not in the Haggadah. He is in a very, he, he, he is a, in a couple of pages, but it's, it's not only mentioned very briefly. Moses really is not highlighted in any way as an important character in the Exodus in the Haggadah, but his stick is. <laughs> it's really interesting that even his stick gets more credit than Moses does. So why is this a, why do we mention the staff? All of you know the story of the staff, right? That at one point turned into a serpent and Moses used and Aaron used in order to effect the plagues. So one idea is it is precisely because, again, we're emphasizing uh, that it was not Moses who led the charge towards liberation. Saying the staff, it, the very point of it is to say, not Moses. It was a magic wand that God gave him, and Moses was just holding the wand. 
And the idea is to separate, you know, magic and God and the supernatural from the natural. We were just following along with God's plan. But I think there's a there's a couple of other um, there's a couple of other explanations that I think are really important. The first is uh, in the Mishnah, it says that the staff was created um, when the world was created. The, there is an opinion, and, the, and Maimonides is most famous for articulating it, that supernatural oh. miracles um, are, are, have, were all predestined from the point of creation. You know, Maimonides is very rational in the way he looks at the world. The world functions according to laws and order. So how do we explain supernatural miracles? So Maimonides and others take the supernatural miracles and say they are part of the law and order with which the world was created. And so one should not rely on miracles today in order to govern our lives. The stick, the staff, was there at the moment of creation. It was not created in the moment. Does that change a little bit of our comfort with the whole idea of praying for miracles and relying on miracles? I don't know. But it expresses, I think, at, at a, an important juncture in the Haggadah, it addresses, you know, as I've been saying, the Haggadah answers every question, asks every question. Email Elizabeth. So if, if we had miracles then, why don't we have miracles now? Well, one answer could be Hashem preordained, right? And remember, this is a theology that the Haggadah is very comfortable with. Everything was part of God's plan. Slavery was part of God's plan. Even the very staff that would be used to liberate the people was according to God's plan. And that's one inter interesting computer, explanation I, I thought was necessary. I, I, I the other thing that's important is I think it I plays as a nice counterbalance, the staff, to computer. what we just read about the sword. God's mighty hand, and, and outstretched arm. First, the Haggadah says it's the sword. This it was a war. I have, I have then a it almost I takes a step back and says, well... There was no sword. There was a staff. A sword is never going to be enough to get you victory. In the Jewish context, you also need what the staff represents, which is not just might. The staff represents justice, right? How does a judge, how does a judge announce the verdict? He and or ask for order in the court? takes the, what's it called, a, 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 ga a gavel, right, the gavel, which is a blunt object, and uses it to call attention to order and authority and justice, right? So maybe that, that is what the staff represents, the aspect of, um, the aspect of conflict that requires justice to be on uh, uh, to be also on the side uh, of those who are victorious. I liked that explanation. Another one, though, that I want to mention, um, uh, the, just a final one, relates to the Midrash that talks about the staff being a, almost this magic wand that was created at the start of uh, when the world was created. That same Midrash, which, which says the staff was there at the beginning of the world, says, don't forget this staff, which was used to effect the plagues of Egypt, was also used to command the manna from heaven, to get us water from the desert, to effect the clouds of, dory, of glory and other gifts that the people received in the wilderness. 
The staff was not just used. And, and remember the same staff at the beginning of the story, we know this from, from the Torah itself, was used right to show it, that turned into a serpent in order to show that, uh, in order to show, it's funny, the same staff which was designed to show the power of God is also at the beginning showing how the how the um, the person the human has no power right not to wage a war but to bring down miracles that are good right like water for the desert so so what does this um, staff represent and this is what I really liked about the staff this staff which you might think is an evil weapon which brings about destruction and violence and death. That's not the whole story. The same staff brings life. Such is a very common um, observation about religion itself. Usually, that which can do great good is also capable of doing great harm. And religion is one of those things. Religion, which is responsible for many wars and friction and violence and death, also can bring people together in ways nothing else can for good. So I really like this metaphor of the staff being a symbol for a tool that is used to bring about transformation that can do incredible good and also can do incredible bad and did both. And, uh, and it's all about how you use it and when you use it. So uh, I really like this, this metaphor, and I think there's different ways to look at it, why the Haggadah may have included a reference to the staff, but a lot of ways that I think are important in bringing about interesting themes to our, to our Seder. And Moftim, that's the Otot, Moftim. What are the Moftim, the wonders? This is the blood, as it is written, and I will demonstrate wonders in heaven and on earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. I will demonstrate wonders in heaven and earth, blood, fire, and heaven and smoke is a verse from the Bible, from the book of Joel, which is not a well-known book of the Bible that we read very often, but it's a, it's a short book, part of the 13 small prophetic books of the Bible, the Trey Asar. And Joel is speaking about how at the end of times, in the dawn of the final redemption, there will be an aspect of violence or maybe chaos. tremendous chaos. Uh, Dam, blood, ash, fire, timrosh ashan, columns of smoke. Right at the, this is the last word of the four verses. The Haggadah brings about an important theme that, that is uh, um, crucial, I think, in understanding uh, what, what Pesach is trying to tell us. Watching a lot of those Rabbi, you may have me. heard from the Talmud, In Nisan, we were we were redeemed, and in the future, we will also be redeemed in Nisan. What the Haggadah is doing is it's saying the redemption back then cannot be separated from the ultimate redemption of the world in the messianic era and they are related 
They're not the same. The Messiah didn't come at the Exodus from Egypt, but they are related. How? <laughs> Both events talk about no, the, ne the, the necessity the for chaos and violence before freedom or stability or peace is achieved. So it's actually a very appropriate way to end the last word of the uh, of the with, of the four verses, because it's it's looking forward to the ultimate redemption. Here we were liberated with plagues, but in years from now, when the Messiah comes, we will see plagues again. Dam Joel talked about them. Dam va'esh v'timrot ashan. And that the exodus does not mark the end of uh, our story. There's much more to be told. And the story will not end until the ultimate liberation is achieved in the messianic era. Right. These three plagues, Dam, Vaesh, Vitimrot, Ashan, begin the counting of 16 plagues that where we drop a cup of wine, we spill a little bit of wine from our glasses. Right. So if you follow along with the Haggadah, the last three words of that verse in Joel, dam va'esh v'timrot ashan, timrot ashan is two words. So the last four words, right, are the first three. Then it says davar acher. Davar acher means there's another way to look at this last verse of the four. How, what is the other way to look at it? that, you know, we just spent a lot of time going over each word by word, but this other explanation says, no, you can look at this verse in a different way, that each word is enumerating the 10 plagues. Beyad chazaka, that's two words, mighty arm, mighty hand, that's two, bizroa nituya, two, moragado, two, Otot, since otot is a plural word, signs, so plural must be at least two. Moftim, wonders, is another plural word, so that's two. If you add it up, two, 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 you get to ten. What are ten? Elu eser makot shevi akadosh baruch ha mitzrayim ve'elohen. And then you enumerate the ten. Dam, Svardeya, Kinim. And then there's another three. So we have the three from Joel. Then we have this other way of understanding the fourth verse, which says, oh, this fourth verse is all about the 10 plagues. Let's say them and drop out, spill a cup of wine for each one. And then we go to Rabbi Yehuda, who says, actually, uh, I used to remember these plagues using a mnemonic device. What's his mnemonic device? Detzach Adash Be'achav. And the mnemonic device is another three plagues. It's like, a, it's like a way of saying the plagues with another three words. So you have three, ten, and another three, that's 16. You following the math? Okay. I said last week I would talk about this custom of spilling the wine. The earliest, sent, the earliest mention of spilling the wine when we say each one of those 16 plagues is in the 16th century in Worms, which, which is in, which is in um, Ashkenaz. What do we know from the 16th century in Worms? Well, this is the era of the... Crusades or post Crusades, where the Jewish communities in many different parts of Ashkenaz were slaughtered. Right? As the Crusaders made their way down to Jerusalem. 
many of the rituals that become prominent about uh, death and memorializing come from that time in Jewish history. Yizker, for instance, Av Harachamim, a prayer in the Sidur, which asks for God to wreak vengeance on those who destroyed our communities. That's in our Sidur, in all Ashkenazi Sidurim. They come from or became more important after the, destruct, after the destruction of these communities in Ashkenaz around this era, right? Terrible pogroms launched against the Jewish community, which helps us, I think, understand a little bit about where this comes from. If you ask most people why we, why we dip the 16, uh, why we spill 16 uh, drops of wine, they'll cite this midrash that says that, well, we're crying because Jews don't, you know, we, we um, are sad that humans had to die. We're sad that people had to die in order for us to be liberated. We wish blood would not have had to be shed in the first place. That is a, a beautiful midrash. I like that a lot. It's just not authentic. It came about later. And it's a nice thing. I think that the midrash says, um, that God is angry when he hears the song at the sea being sung because God says, my creatures are drowning and yet you're singing songs, right? That God doesn't take sides. He's on the side of humanity. And whenever some have to die so that others can be free, God isn't happy, <clears throat> right? So we spill out the wine to represent almost the tears or the lessening of our joy but it's not original. The original has to do with the experience of Jewish communities living after these terrible pogroms. And when they hear the plagues, right? There's a piece of them that wants them to come back. There's a piece of, and this is an acknowledgement of how difficult Jewish history is. Um, when we're reciting the plagues, we're spilling the wine. You know, when we say dam, blood, we're spilling it on the floor so that maybe these plagues will return upon our enemies. 16 is a number, is an important number. Because in the book of Jeremiah, it says that God's sword has 16 sides to it. Or the word sword is mentioned 16 times, which gives the impression that God's sword has 16 faces. So we're, every time we spill the wine, the 16 times, it's almost like we're saying, just like God's sword back then uh, destroyed our enemies, so do we hope that God's sword today should befall our enemies. In other words, the spilling of the wine is really mystical. And we actually have stories of people in, in Middle Eastern countries going out on Seder night, on the, on the night of the Passover Seder with their wine and pouring it on the doorsteps of their enemies, right? That's probably where this comes from. Wine looks like blood and because uh, the plagues are at this point in the Seder, what we're talking about, we sort of say some of this plague should go, we still need on the people who uh, are against us today, our enemies today. Now this acrostic is very interesting. Rabbi Galinkin wrote a whole paper on Rabbi Judah's acrostic. The 10 plagues we understand, right? We enumerate all of them. Why does Rabbi Judah not, need, not remember the 10 plagues? Why does he need detzach adash be'achav? What's the point? Some say that this is about Jacob and Esau because adash 
Are you with me at the mnemonic device, Rabbi Judah's mnemonic device in the Haggadah? Detzach Adash Bachav. Rabbi Judah was wont to give the plagues, plagues an acrostic. Detzach Adash Bachav. Adash is a lentil. And ach, be'ach av, sounds like brother. Ach, brother. So lentils and brothers, our minds immediately go to, oh, lentils and brothers, Jacob and Esau. This is a later interpretation. It is interesting. It connects to the theme of covenant, which we talked about in previous classes, right? That the Exodus was affected by covenant. God remembered, he made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and through that covenant had to liberate the people, had to liberate their descendants. So maybe we're mentioning the lentil soup and the brothers to remind ourselves that, hey, we got the covenant fair and square. Why fair and square? Because some might say it wasn't fair of Jacob to take the, to take the blessing from his brother. But remember, when they were younger, Jacob and Esau, you know, remember the story. Esau was hungry, coming back from the field. Jacob says, oh, you want lentil soup? Sell me your bichar. Sell me your firstborn status. Sure, whatever. Give me the soup. Um, and, and maybe so in this point of the Haggadah, we're, we're reminding ourselves of that story to reaffirm our um, to reaffirm our entitlement to the covenant. There was a lot of, you know, I, we've talked about this a lot in, in this class about the um, relationship between Passover and Easter, right? What is the assertion of the church? following the destruction of the temple the destruction of the according to the church the covenant was lost by the jews because they rejected the messiah and um, rightfully went to the christians jews were no longer children of the covenant so i think it's actually very uh important that at some point in the Haggadah, we are responding, saying, no, <laughs> where the, they were, at least our ancestors, the children of Jacob. Jacob also did something that you may not have liked, but that fair and square entitled him to be the bearer of the covenant. The Jews were not deceptive in acquiring the covenant. And Esau, which remember in the rabbinic imagination represents who? Who is Esau represented for the rabbis? Esau represents Christians. The world, Christians, Edom. Right, just like Ishmael represents Muslims. Edom. In rabbinic literature, they'll often refer to Esau or Edom, which is where Esau goes as the Romans, the Christians. So it may be this is brought up in that context almost in a hidden way. Sometimes when we see something in the Haggadah that's really obscure and that doesn't make a lot of sense like this, Rabbi Judah gave them a sign, Detzach Adash Be'achav, which is like, what? Who cares about an his mnemonic device that he used to remember them? Sometimes when it doesn't make sense, our suspicion is the author is trying to say something that he can't articulate for one reason or another. And one of the common reasons why an author can't articulate something is because it's anti-Christian. And he's afraid of saying it in a way that would offend or get them in big trouble. So Detzach Adash Ba'achav could very well be the entry into our discussion of rightful claim to the covenant, which Jews need to establish at this season explicitly, where the Christians are saying this same dinner, 
marks the abandonment of the Jewish entitlement to covenant by, from God. Right? Jews rejected Jesus. That's why they've lost the right to the covenant. And I've got, at the end, we'll, we'll ask a few, we'll, we'll get to them. Maybe come back soon <laughs> and you'll help me ans answer the questions. I see I have some questions online, but Daniel's not here today. Rivka's helping us. So she'll, she'll come back in a few moments and help with the questions that are on. Another possibility is that <laughs> it's less interesting, but another possibility is that um, people didn't have Haggadot. Not everybody could afford books. And Rabbi Judah is using a mnemonic device to remember, oh, Detzach Hadash Bachav. That'll help me remember the 10 plagues and the order they were in. There's also a Midrash that says that those words were written on the staff. Detzach Hadash Bachav were written on the staff. So Moses knew exactly what order the plagues had to come. Blood, frogs, lice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's the acrostic. Now let's get to the three rabbis. Rabbi Yossi Haglili. I don't know if you see that. Rabbi Yossi the Galilean. So the Haggadah here brings in a dialogue between three rabbis. It's a conversation, a, a sample conversation of what was keeping the rabbis up all night talking about the exodus from Egypt. These three rabbis, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Eliezer, and Rabbi Akiva, their conversation is probably a late addition to the Haggadah, and they're talking about how many plagues there were exactly. Were there 10? Were there 16? One says there were many more, dozens more. There's a debate as to how many plagues there actually were because because it is a little bit interesting that we are numbering um the plagues the 10 plagues even though uh the it is the destruction that those plagues created that really matters right it's it's almost like we're failing to take into account uh, what each of those plagues, the power that each of those plagues had, right? How can we say that uh, blood counts for one, but also the death of the firstborn counts for one? Shouldn't the death of the firstborn count for a hundred? So that's, I think, at the root of this. How do we enumerate plagues? And is it really fair to enumerate them? But there's a deeper message in all three of these, in all three of these rabbis' discussions. All three mention an event that we have not mentioned yet. Which event is it? Take a look very closely in the Haggadah. We talk about Egypt concerning. On what basis can one say that the Egyptians were smitten with 10 plagues in Egypt, but where else were there 50 plagues? The sea. Rabbi Yossi says there were five times the power of those plagues at the sea. Rabbi Eliezer says no, not five times the power at the sea. At the sea, there were 200 plagues. There were 40 plagues in Egypt and 200 at the sea. Rabbi Akiva says, no, in Egypt, there were 50 plagues. And at the sea, there were 250. All three agree and disagree about something. One thing, right? All three disagree about how many plagues there were in Egypt and how many plagues there were at the sea, how we quantify. But what do they all agree on? They all agree that the plagues or maybe the event itself that happened at the sea 
was much more important, much more powerful than what happened in Egypt. This is also reflected in the way our liturgy is composed. We mention in our prayer services the redemption at the sea or the splitting of the sea every single morning. This is all the passage in the Bible that talks about the song at the sea, the drowning of the Egyptians at the sea. It is mentioned in the prayer service every morning. When are the 10 plagues mentioned in the prayers in the prayer service? Nowhere. <laughs> So even our liturgy accords greater status, greater importance to the event at the sea than the liberation of Egypt. Don't you find this surprising? I mean, I thought what happened that was important were in the course of the, that time in Egypt where all these different plagues came. Sounds terrible. I mean, the sea, yeah, it was also a tremendous miracle. But it happened once, the sea split, then it crashed down on the pursuers and it was over. Aren't you surprised to hear that in the rabbinic mindset, this is obvious that the sea was a more powerful experience? So help me, at least those who are in the room, why do you think, Try and think about this question. Why was the crossing of the seas seen by the Haggadah and even in our liturgy as a more important event in Jewish history, or at least a more important event as a, as a, in the course of the Exodus than the 10 plagues? What do you think? Why is the splitting of the sea more important? Population. You could say because of how many people died, right? It was, uh, who knows how many people were in those chariots pursuing our ancestors and, and maybe the, the power of that final plague was stronger than the power of those plagues in Egypt. And actually allowed them to so that is what I think is more what Merle's saying is I think more the trend in rabbinic commentary on this question, right? The plagues were part of the process of the Exodus, but the splitting of the sea sealed it. It was its final conclusion. Why? Well, you could say for several reasons. People say in a war, this was the decisive victory. There are many different wars, but remember, even after the 10th plague, Pharaoh still decided a few days later to chase after. In other words, even the plague of the firstborn did not conquer Pharaoh's will to stop pursuing. And as long as you know your enemy is still out there and still has his eyes on you, are you really free? It's only at the sea where Pharaoh gives up and finally says, we're going to leave these people alone. Watch you, so what happened in today's news? I'm, I'm out of it. Right, so you see how well, so the question is, is this an escalation or is this decisive? No, but it's like he, he's not getting his way and he's just, it's like Pharaoh incarnate. Right, so, so Pharaoh's pursuit keeps getting stronger. And so that's an interesting point, Merle, is that um, why, why is the plague why is the crossing at the sea such a seminal event in the Haggadah that the rabbis all feel it was a bigger wonder? Because 
the ferocity of the Egyptians had reached its climax at that moment. The, at the beginning of the plagues, yeah, there were wars. You could say there were little assaults, but the Egyptians, we were, we were just getting our hands wet. It was just starting off. You needed a tremendous force by the time of the 10th plague. The Egyptians were so angry that they had lost so much. Their intensity, their ferocity reached its climax, and God needed to respond with an event in kind that would finally put an end to it, and that's what the crossing of the sea. I didn't even think of that. That's excellent, uh, excellent observation. Most commentaries take the opinion that what happened at the crossing of the sea really marked the boundary between freedom and slavery. That event was the end. Now, you could see that from two perspectives. First, you can see it from the perspective of the Egyptian pursuers. It stopped after the sea. It was the boundary. They didn't, they, they did not chase, you know, they use the expression, you can run, but you can't hide. I mean, we could imagine it, without that event at the crossing of the sea, we never would have been liberated. The Egyptians would have been our constant enemy. It ain't that far, Egypt and, and Israel. And even if we would have made it there, they could have kept pursuing. Is that real freedom? Are you really free when you know that there are people out there who hate you? They may not be coming to get you today, but they, they hate you with such a ferocity, they could come and get you at any moment. And that is to me really interesting because I think it speaks to freedom in the context of, of what it's like to be an Israeli today maybe more so in previous decades, but is Israel really a free country knowing how many enemies are surrounding it? There may not be a suicide bomb today or a Yom Kippur war that's being launched against it. But when you know your enemy has you in sight, can you really be free? Or are all of your actions and motivations influenced by the fact that a wrong move could bring a wrong move or not investing in your protection and your security. I mean, is that real freedom when you're in fear constantly of your enemy coming to get you? That's, yes. That's the reality of Israel today. It's terror attacks. There's, it's absolutely the reality of Israel today. It's terror, terror attacks. In another era, it was invasions of armies of foreign countries, but it's the same thing, right? Are you really free when your enemy is still pursuing you? And that's why the 10 plagues are less important. Because Pharaoh's pursuit, his hatred, still wasn't vanquished. And why the crossing of the sea marks that moment, perhaps. It's only when the enemy said, enough. We'll, let, we'll just let them go when freedom could really be achieved because now you weren't constantly in fear and weren't making decisions motivated by fear. And when you're making decisions purely out of fear, then your own well-being comes second. And everything is just a reaction. Nothing is about self-determination. So it's a really um, important, I think, conversation. Sometimes people skip over these passages. What, what are they talking about? 50 plagues, 250 plagues. No, no, no. It's talking about the splitting of the sea being more important. And this is the only place in the Haggadah where the splitting, of, well, except for the Psalms, uh, for uh, Hallel, but Seit Yisrael Mitzrayim, they cross the sea. But, but in this story, this is where the crossing of the sea gets its place. And it's being, in, it's being included in the Haggadah, I think, is of tremendous importance. The other way to look at it is not that this is the event that stops the Egyptians from pursuing, but it marks the point of no return for our ends, for the children of Israel themselves, for our ancestors themselves. The crossing of the sea represents the point of no return. We can't go back. 
Because if you can't cross one way, you can't cross the other way either. Right? Here you are. Your enemy is running after you. You've made it to safety on the other side. But we know from the story that it that the slave mentality of these liberated slaves, some of them said, let's go back. It was better in Egypt. That's told through the story in the Torah. But they couldn't really go back. These were just, these were complaints. But the sea marked the point of no return. And sometimes that's important in life too, to cut the cord. And only when you do that, can you really move on. We may have left Egypt and they may have stopped pursuing us, but so long as the thought was in our head, I could go back. I could go back if I want to. It's in a way it traps you because because all of your experiences in life, particular one, particularly ones that are difficult, you're entertaining the idea in the back of your head, well, I could always go back. I could always go back. It's only when the cord is cut. And that's what the C represents, where you have to face your demons, where you have to conquer your challenges. When there's no alternative, you have to move forward. Sometimes I know in many people's stories about their lives, they, they, they can relate to this message, right? It's much more difficult to move forward when you know you have other options. <laughs> you can always go back, right? But when, you, when things happen in your life, even difficult things that prevent running away, you have to move forward, whether it's challenging or not. You have to confront what's in front of you and do your best because there is no alternative, right? So I think that's another way of looking at the splitting of the sea. It is both an important event from the perspective of those pursuing us and from our own knowledge that we could never go back there. That was not an option anymore. And while we might have said, let's go back to Egypt, it was just talk. We knew we couldn't get back there. Okay. Do we have time for Dianu? Or is it Dianu? No, we do have time for Dianu. Okay, good. This leads into the discussion of the deads of the sea, the crossing of the sea, leads to Kama Ma'alot Tovot Lamakom Aleinu. Dayenu, as you all know, this goes back to an early class of mine in the fall, is one of the most popular songs at the Seder. And the beauty of the singing, right, is that we're singing memories. These are all about events in Jewish history that bring people together. Singing is really important in the Seder because remember, it's a communal experience. And singing brings people together in a familiar way, especially this tune. Dayenu is a song of gratitude. And it is there at this moment in the Seder, clearly to follow the rules of how we have to tell the story. If the exodus from Egypt truly ends with the splitting of the sea, if that is the point when we are liberated, then, this, then that ends the story. Well, with the story over, we forgot something. And that is, the Mishnah says, you tell the story, mignut le shevach, from, a, from, um, from your suffering to your praise, shevach, to your appreciation. So this is a way of praising God. It concludes the story by saying, now that we're done telling the story, let us express gratitude. That's Dayenu. Dayenu means it would have been enough if God just, do, just did this. So before I get into some of the messages of Dayenu, just a note. Kama ma'alot tovot lamakom aleinu is how this starts. Ma'alot is a strange word. How many, how does, how do your Haggadot 
how, many, how do your Haggadotah translate ma'alot? If I was trying to say, look how many wonderful things God did for us, I would maybe use the word kama dvarim, how many things tovim asalanu. Look at all these wonderful things. Look at all these wonderful miracles. This word ma'alot is very strange. How does, how does your Haggadah translate it? What's that? Favors. Favors. How many favors? Mine says kindnesses. Advantages. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you can use the uh, interesting. The, when, the fact that all of our translations are different means um, all, means this word is a problem. But it's actually not a problem. It's here for a very specific reason. There you go. Ma'alot. To ascend. La'alot. How do the Psalms begin? Many of them. Shir la'alot. Song of ascents. So we shouldn't miss this in the Haggadah. It doesn't mean kindnesses. It doesn't mean, uh, what was it? Favors or advantages. Kama ma'alot is a reference to the steps leading up to the temple that are sung of in the Psalms. Shir la ma'alot, the song of ascending up to the temple. What is the last verse of Dayenu? What is Beit HaBechira? If God had brought us into the land of Israel, but did not build for us a, a temple. A temple. So this is perfect. Right? It's very purposeful. The other thing that you have to notice is how many verses are there? There are 15. 15 verses in Dayenu. 15 are the exact number of steps. You can actually go now and see them. The exact number of steps that were required to get from one part of the, of, the, of the temple complex to the important part of the temple complex. And no, it was on those holy steps that people, that's why the Psalms say a song of ascents. Because these psalms were recited as you would ascend up towards the shrine at the top of the temple. This is a song that ends up at the top of the temple. So it's shir la ma'alot, kama ma'alot. Look at all of the steps it took to get to where we are going. 15 is a very important number in Judaism. It also is God's name, right? Yah is a name of God. yud Hey, yud Hey is 15. So it's an important number that speaks about ascending up to the temple. Some things I want to note about Dayenu, and then I'll take questions from the, uh, from, from the audience. Okay, not only that, about the 15 steps and about how the story is told, and about its relationship to the temple. Is this story true? Is the story Dayenu tells true? We were grateful when God did this for us, and we were grateful when God did that for us. We were grateful when he brought us out of Mitzrayim. We were grateful when he split the sea for us. We were grateful when he gave us the Torah. Is that the, is that the story the Torah really tells? I mean, it, it's not. And in fact, there's a, there's a psalm that makes that clear. The story the, temp the Torah tells is we were not a very grateful bunch. <laughs> and even though all these wonderful things were done for us in the desert, we rebelled several times and we were not always very grateful. So this is in, in some Haggadot, you'll see the commentary that this song is being offered as a tikkun. A tikkun is a repair. It's almost saying, look, our ancestors could not find the capacity for gratitude following their freedom because they were still very much captured in, in a, the mentality of a slave. And a slave can't really feel gratitude. You're still just, you have not understood the ability for life to get better. 
because you've been wallowing in misery for years and years and years. But we are not them. Here, years later, we are not slaves. We're free. We do have the capacity to be grateful. And we can offer a tikkun. That is, even though our ancestors were not grateful, we will be. And we'll talk about how, and this is what we're doing in Dayenu, we'll talk about how wonderful each one of these events were and how grateful we are for it. Now, there's something in the song that's a little bit odd, and that is at every step, we say it would have been enough. But the truth is at every step, if we would have stopped there, we would have been dead, <laughs> right? Well, if God hadn't split the sea for us, why are we saying it would have been enough? We would, be, we would have died. <laughs> so in truth, Dayenu, Dayenu has to be seen as a, as a whole piece. Not step by step, but, the, but Dayenu is giving us the message that when you express gratitude, you have to be aware that gratitude often requires a multifaceted, an appreciation for its multifaceted nature. Let me give you an example. You go to the, you go to the dentist and the dentist does a wonderful job giving you your crown or fixing your cavity. What do most people do if you, if you did a good job? So you say, you say, thank you so much. Did you thank, did you, maybe the dentist is a bad example. I know every, nobody likes their dentist, but let's say you did, okay? You had a wonderful dentist. He did a great job <laughs> and you thank him. But do you thank the receptionist who made your appointment? Do you thank the um, dental hygienist who made sure that your dentist wouldn't have to have done that operation on all your other teeth. Do you thank the medical school or the, excuse me, the dental school that gave your dentist the teaching <laughs> required to attend? Do you thank the donors to that medical school who allowed it to operate? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the gratitude that we give is a Dayenu type of gratitude. It's an insufficient. Even though Dayenu means it would have been sufficient, the real meaning behind this, because it keeps going on and on and on, is it's never sufficient. If God, first God did this for us, that would have been enough. Oh yeah, but then he also did this for us. That would have been enough. Oh, but. You see, if Dayenu was real, if, if this song really was about it would have been enough, it would be very short. It would be one verse. If God would have done this to us, it would have been enough. Over. But because it keeps continuing over and over and over, the, the mess, it's actually counterintuitive. Dayenu is about how our appreciation can never be sufficient. And that most of the ways that we express gratitude in life will always be insufficient. And we should be aware of that. When you are grateful to somebody, don't forget that they would not have been who they are without their parents, without their schooling, without their, uh, who knows, the scholarship they received to attend school. Without Our Gratitude is a theme of the Haggadah. It's not just a theme. It may be the most important theme of the Haggadah. That's why it doesn't say you tell the story from, uh, from captivity to freedom. It says you tell the story from captivity to gratitude. So, so that's what Dayenu is really helping us to appreciate. If you really think about what makes the world beautiful, what makes good things possible in the world, you will also need to sing Dayenu because you will never ever get there 
to understand how complex the webs of life are that make us who we are and make for good things to happen. So gratitude is always, Dayenu, it's always insufficient. We'll never be able to really express gratitude to everybody and everything that makes good things possible. And yet, Dayenu ends with this alachat kama vechama. Right after it sings, after we sing the song Dayenu, which I say, which I'm offering to you, is counterintuitively not about a, not a song about the limits of gratitude, but about the limitlessness of gratitude and and the limitedness of our ability to express it. Our gratitude ought to be limitless, but we don't have the ability to articulate every, everything that makes good things possible. Still, Dayenu ends with this piece, Alachat kama vechama tova chula umechufelet lamakom aleinu. Alachat kama vechama. Do you see that in the Haggadah? We still should go achat, one by one and do our best when we are grateful to name those events in this case, it, but it could also be people that helped, that made a difference, that got us to where we were going. So now we start, these are things Again, 15. Here are 15 things that we can specifically enumerate. Good morning. Think about, you go, think about going to somebody's house for dinner. And yeah. you tell the host just a minute, of the dinner. Just a minute, it was a beautiful meal. Thank you so much. Hold the line a moment, please, will you? Right. I've got to turn this on. What's off. better, I don't know. that you say wow. that or that you I'm say to a, the host? I'm on a, Program. This was a beautiful evening. I really I liked the chicken song. you made. It was delicious. And then I really loved the way you welcomed us uh, in to your home. You were very gracious. And you made us feel comfortable in your home from the moment we arrived. And I love the fact that when you, you know, and you keep going on. Uh, what's more meaningful to a host? Obviously, everyone appreciates when we make the effort to be specific about whatever it was that we're grateful for. And yet that's not where our minds first go. Our minds first go to thank you so much for, thank you so much for dinner, I really appreciated it. But the message of Dayenu is alachat kama vekam, as much as possible. The way to express gratitude in Judaism is by naming, individually, specifically, what you are grateful for. Some people joke that the whole Siddur is, could just be summarized with, thanks for everything, God, I really appreciate it. And you know what? It could be. <laughs> if you wanted to have a Siddur, you know, thanks God for, thank you God for everything. Actually, there's a version of Birkat Amazon. It says in the Talmud, if you don't have time to say thanks to God after your meal, do the whole Birkat Hamazon, you just say, thanks God for the bread. And that's it. But why do we not do that? Why is that not our standard? Why do we do the whole Birkat Hamazon? Because it's specific, because it says, God, you nourish the whole world with your bounty. Thank you for the land that you have given us, which allows us to cultivate food and livestock. Thank you for the gift of being a people because without freedom, we wouldn't be able to cultivate anything in the first place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Alachat kama vikama. Even though gratitude, you will never be able to cover all your bases. The more specific we can be, the better. And the ultimate you know, way of expressing gratitude is to use that ability to dig deeper into what you are grateful for and be specific. And you'll find, I think the, the, the beauty of that is that 
you'll find yourselves to be a far more grateful person. <laughs> it's very easy to say, thanks for dinner. But when you make the effort to pay attention to everything that it takes to make that dinner, this is an example, but I'm a food, <laughs> you see where my mind is at. Um, and, and by the way, this, this really applies to satyrs because for those of you who have hosted satyrs before, they are exhausting and very difficult. So it's actually a perfect time for the Haggadah to remind everybody, when you leave that Seder, alachat, remember each individual thing that it took for your host to prepare that meal. What they had to do, get babysitters for the kids, kosher the kitchen, buy all the meat, stand in line at no frills, et cetera, et cetera. You, you go on and on, organize the tables. They didn't sleep for two nights in a row. They were, you know, you could go on and on and on. And, it, and, the, and suddenly your ability to be a grateful person and to cultivate a grateful personality becomes, becomes much more effective. You're, this is calling us to be aware. If you just be, try not to say thank you. I mean, <sighs> practice this spiritual exercise. Try never to say thank you in one sentence. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no more, no less than one sentence. Okay, always say thank you. I thought I didn't have to say that. <laughs> I thought that would be understood. Yes. Only one person said thank you. One couple left without even saying thank you. Okay, that I thought I wouldn't have to say to this crowd, right? But try and never say thank you in less than one sentence, right? In less than one sentence and see if that makes a difference for you. When you say thank you to somebody, mention also one or two things that you're specifically grateful for. And I guarantee you that person will receive it in a better way and you will have a deeper appreciation for them. You'll be more aware, you'll, which makes us more humble and gentler and kinder towards others. Thank you so much for this, Seder. It must have been really hard for you to get everybody together like this. Or thanks for a beautiful, it must be really hard for you to have been up all night last night. I know with everything else going on in your home, this must have been so difficult. Wow. So that's all alachat kama vikama. In Judaism, the more specific you can be with your gratitude, the better. Okay, Renee, are there any questions online that are that you think um, okay. uh, Mel, we're over time? Rabbi. Mel says. Rabbi says, spilling wine on the floor. I never heard about the floor. We yeah. always spilled onto a plate, never messing the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All I said, Mel, was we have, we have stories from uh, modern stories. I mean, uh, this I'm talking two, 200 years ago, specifically from Middle Eastern countries, Iraq, where uh, Jews would go around and pour the blood of the, uh, the blood, pour the wine from their cups on Seder night on the homes of their enemies. And um, yes, in most homes, we just put it on the table. Right. Um, and that is the more prevalent custom. But what I was trying to get at is why we spill the wine in the first place. And the reason is because the 16 sorted, right? We believe the wine represents the power of the, of the plagues, the 16 faced sword of God. And this custom came about during a time in Jewish history where, you know, people were not very happy with, with their neighbors and pouring out, you know, we have to recognize that sometimes that unhappiness manifests in the desire for revenge or a vengeance. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Dr. Rose Romani, yes. I think it's more of a comment, but she wrote Sephardi mixed the blood with water, then discarded outside the house. And now I suspect it's the blood and tears. Mixed yeah, together. interesting. Interesting. It's either Rose, it's either the blood and tears mixed together or the emphasis is on the blood. It's not the tears. It's the emphasis on the wine representing the blood, particularly the blood of our enemies and pouring that um, and pouring that is sort of like, uh, may you have these plagues that that God once put on us. One last class before the Seder. I think we're going to get to the meal. I think we will. We'll pick up next week with Rabban Gamliel. Thank you, everybody.